You know, there's only three books in Peter, so we're growing. Because I know if y'all know the last time, it was only one book and the one they gave me last time. So it's getting a little bigger, you know what I'm saying? So anyway, we're going somewhere tonight. This this second Peter's tough. It's it's tough. This is the last time that uh, we'll hear from Peter on this side of eternity. Um, we know through uh, the Bible, and so we have to, okay, so we have to stay with the Word. The Word is the truth, okay? Anything outside of the truth, you have to acknowledge where it came from. If it's in here, it's the truth. This is, there, everything in here is the absolute truth. It is the only thing that's truth in this world now. And so the enemy tries so hard, the very first thing he does is try to attack the Word. You can see it all the way back in Genesis. Uh, the very first thing, he, t- he tempted Adam and Eve with the word. And he questioned them. Did God really say that? You know. So the word is truth. So in the word, we know there was a lot of rumors about how Peter died. We, we know that he was crucified upside down. We believe that. I did a lot of research on that. Um, I actually bought a book it's called Fox's uh, Book of Martyrs. Uh, I challenge you to get that book. If you don't have it, it's eight bucks. It'll be at your house tomorrow. I dare you to get it. It is incredible. I mean, it has all of the disciples, how they were martyred. Uh, and uh, just a real sobering look at the lives that they really lived. And it, the, guys, we've got it made in this country. What we describe as Christianity don't even compare. I mean, when you really get down to the nuts and bolts of it, man, we... We are spoiled rotten, really. But uh, I, I began to look, and, and, and there's some amazing stories of Peter in there about people's, inter- uh, what they heard, and that stories that were passed down. But it is, it is rumored to believe that he was crucified upside down um, because he felt unworthy to die as, his, as the Lord did. Um, Peter was beheaded. And both of these uh, were, were happened under one ruler. And I'm going to take you there. We're fixing to go there. I'm, I'm laying the groundwork. The reason Peter was beheaded was because he was a Roman citizen. Uh, they, if you were a Roman citizen, it was very rarely did you, uh, were you crucified. Uh, Peter, not being a Roman citizen, he fit the grounds for that. And so they, they, uh, it all happened under an emperor named Nero. So I'm going to lay the groundwork. I'm fixing to take you there. I, I, want to, I want to do that so that in your mind, you can focus and you can try to picture what's going on. Uh, we know Peter wasn't in Rome uh, for a lengthy time. Uh, he came, a lot of theologians believe he came in after Paul had already been beheaded. Um, so he went there knowing the circumstances of what was going on. And, I, you know, I, listen... I'm with you. I've been through the, the whole, this whole COVID deal, running a business, and, and I've been through the whole election process, and I've heard all the things. I've gotten away from that uh, because I know where my truth is. And so you always have to go back to the truth. There's going to be stuff going on, and it's going to continue to grow. You've got to focus on what I've got to get you to do. And, and, it, and me and Pastor talked about it the other day. When you know what's right for somebody and you can't you just you know it's so frustrating to see guys that I try to direct and and pour into them and and direct them back to the word and they get it for a little bit and then they drift off but let's go there so as Pastor Laborg would say some of you guys probably know we're going to set the tenor and the tone for the text so second Peter uh we find that uh in this will be the last time we hear from Peter um, Peter is in Rome somewhere around the time of 64 to 67 AD uh, Rome was a place to be um, these were prosperous times very good Rome was an awesome place to be they had basically under the first emperor they had basically increased the territory of Rome to encompass a huge area um, other countries neighboring countries that they had not conquered basically was at peace with Rome because they knew living next to Rome brought security to them as well. There were prosperous times. There was plenty of work going on. Um, under this emperor, Nero, the, the taxes were low. He was increasing um, 
building stuff. I was basically broke the country's building stuff. So there was work for everybody. Everything, anything everybody, anybody would want was there. It was an awesome place to be uh, as long as you wasn't a Christian. You could be a Christian, but you, you really don't want to you know, make it known. Kind of fly on the radar. You know, keep it low key. You could worship God, but not, out, I mean, don't make a big noise about it. I mean, just keep it quiet. Well, Nero, you got to understand where he came from. There was a lot of scandals going on. You think, hey, hey if they had had CNN and, 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 the, and the media back then, they would have had a field day. Uh, most of these emperors were murdered. Uh, Nero, he was actually uh, adopted. His, his mother was Agrippa the Younger, and she was the sister of Caligula. If you know anything about emperors, Caligula was basically, he lost his mind uh, and, and just did unbelievable things. Uh, but Caligula was murdered by some of his own men, and so his uncle Claudius became the emperor, and uh, Claudius wound up marrying Agrippa the Younger. So she marries her uncle because she has Nero. And she marries him in, uh, on the grounds that he will someday, even though he has a son, and the emperor was normally a hereditary passed on position, even though he has a biological son, she talks him into making her son the emperor. Later on, after they're married, there was a spirit of Jezebel. I mean, you can go back and look at it. It is plain as day, if you know what it is, on this lady. Uh, most of her husbands died. She killed them, poisoned them. She winds up poisoning Claudius, her uncle, because it makes room for her son. Nero comes in. The first thing she does is she starts to implement her rule through her son so that she can get her way through leadership. Uh, not long after that, he, he becomes emperor at 17 years old. He's just a kid, very immature but the leader of this great, massive country, uh, an empire. And so he's not really ready for that leadership role, but yet he's thrust into it, and he's got this mother that just consistently tries to work through him to get her ideals into, the, into law. Later we see that uh, he gets fed up with it. So he attempts to kill her by drowning her in a boat. However, she made it back safely to the shore which infuriates him and his men that didn't handle the job correctly. So he sends them back to do the job, and they carry it out. So he winds up killing his own mother. So I want you to get the mindset of who's leading this country, who's leading this empire. That's the mindset. It's sick. I mean, he's, he's just, he did things that we're going to see that would make Hitler look like a choir boy, literally. Uh, we see him after his mother's death, he kind of begin, he really begins to uh, become unstable. Uh, he spins out of control. Uh, we see him begin to persecute Christians. Uh, the, the main thing that Nero is known for, other than persecuting Christians, is the fire. Uh, most of you probably read it in history books uh, during Nero's reign. He wanted to build for himself large buildings and make a name for himself, but there was no room. Rome was so packed with people. So it was rumored he set fire, or had it set, set fire, and it began to burn, and burned out of control. Burned for nine days. Two-thirds of Rome was burned up, uh, and it's rumored that he sat on his, in his palace while he watched it burn and people die. He just sat on his rooftop and played his fiddle and sang. After the fire, they finally got it put out. They began to blame the Christians. He be, he be, he, they began to look at him as the instigator for the fire. So then they begin to, he makes to make an excuse and he begins to blame the Christians for it. And he tells everybody he's very sure the Christians started it. So he begins to uh, persecute Christians. He begins to round them up and persecute them unmercifully. Uh, some of his tactics would include sewing up some, wild, uh, some of the Christians in wild beast skins and then he would turn them loose around uh, wild dogs and they would just keep at them and keep at them and keep at them until they finally just died. Others, he would put in thick, stiff wax shirts, fix them to trees made out of axle rods 
and set them on fire so that he could illuminate his garden. Just sick in his mind. His list of martyrs would grow to include Paul and Peter. What faith. These are the circumstances and the living conditions that we find Peter in in this book. So when you read it, it's more than just words. This is a letter. And I love it, the fact in here, Pastor Donna, that he knew. He knew that his time was coming. If you look at first, uh, in 2 Peter uh, verse, uh, one, I mean, chapter 1, verse 14, <clears throat> he says, Because I know that I will soon put it aside, it is the tent. He's talking about his body. As our Lord Jesus Christ has made very clear to me, he knew it was coming soon. So he knows. So my question to you tonight is, if you knew, if you knew, you had a short window of time left, and you could write a letter to anybody you knew, the ones that mattered the most, what would you say? Who would it be to? Who would it be to? And what would that letter include? You had time to really think about it. Who would that be? Who are those people? It'd be your family? It'd be brothers and sisters? Would it be people that you work with? Church leaders? Who would it be? What would you say to them? Some of the most important and the most, my favorite parables are the ones that Jesus told right before he knew he was about to leave. Uh, and I think we miss a lot of those. And, and I wish I had time we would go through them. But any time, and, and most of us, we don't ever know when our time is coming, but this man did. So you have to read Second Peter. First Peter, he knew as well. But there's something different about Second Peter that he came back and, and he wrote again just one more time. I want to make sure you guys get this. You know, this is it. And so what is it? What would you write, and who would it be to? So as I'm reading this, I want you to understand and think about that. Think, think about, number one, who's he writing this to? Because this is important. This is it. This is the last time we'll hear from him until he, we see him in eternity. So if you would, I want you to turn to the first, first chapter. We're going to read a little bit. I'm not going to go through all three, but we're going to go in here because if this was me, and I like Peter. He's my favorite disciple in the book. I mean, I, we have a lot in common. I'll just say that. I stick my foot in my mouth a lot. Amen? And uh, the first to jump out of the boat. You know, if that's you, tell me to come. Come. All right, here I go. You know, look at me standing up here. Okay? I'm out of the boat, trust me. Um, but just so many things that I see in Peter's life, I just, I'm thinking, man, that's me. Good gracious. When they came to get Jesus, we learned this in fight the other night. It was a great example. You know, he pulls his sword and clips the guy's ear off. And we all think, well, he, you know, man, he cut that gear. He wasn't aiming for his ear. He was trying to cut the guy's head off. That's that temper that was in him. That, that's in me sometimes. Okay? So I can relate to him, you know. And uh, so it's more personal to me when I read this. Uh, but... You know where he's at. You know the circumstances. You know what's going on. And they're growing churches in this mess. Persecution. We don't get that in this, in this culture we live in. Right now in China, it's as bad as it's ever been. You will not see this on the media. The persecution that's going on in China right now is unbelievable. But the churches there are growing. Un it's a fire that can't be put out. We have to get that fire back before it's too late. I'm very concerned that our next generation is coming. We're going to see persecution here. There are bills set in Congress now to get that established right now. We, we, we've, we've come so far, and we're right on the verge of it. And we look, and when we read this, and these people are, are, are they're, they're, laying it all, they're laying it all on the line. And we look back at last year. My goodness, a little virus coming. I, I, I'm not making light of it because it was serious. 
I almost lost a guy at work just here recently. But still, we lose 30% of the church. And there are churches to this day that are still not open. What's going to happen when it really gets tough? Okay? Because we haven't seen anything yet. I, I firmly believe that. And we, we, we saw this with COVID coming, and, and, and everybody thinks, well, God's coming back. He's coming back. Well, he is coming back. I honestly believe we're in the fourth quarter. There ain't no timeouts left. But just because Joe Biden's the president don't mean that God's going to come back tomorrow, okay? We're going to see this thing through, and God is establishing who is his church right now, okay? Let's read. So remember the questions. Who would you write to? And what would you say? To me, what I would do, and I love doing this with men, is giving men tools. I honestly, firmly believe that if you give the man tools to do the job, they'll get it done. As men. Women, I can't help you. I don't know what you... But but here we go right here. I want you to remember that. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. To those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious, if you got something to highlight, underline that word right there, precious, as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Those two words right there jumped out to me when I read this. Let's keep reading verse 4. And I'm reading through the NIV. So, through these, through these, glory and goodness, he has given us his great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Here we here come the tools, guys. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith, which means you have some, goodness. There's that word again, goodness. And to goodness, knowledge. In your Bible's goodness, I'll stop right there. Some of your Bibles, you probably see virtue. And to goodness, knowledge. And to knowledge, self-control. And to self-control, Perseverance. And to perseverance, godliness. And to godliness, mutual affection or either brotherly love. And to mutual affection, love or Christian love. For if you possess, if you possess these qualities in an increasing measure, which means it's growing. It's not. It's increasing. It's, it's growing. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure... They will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word tonight. Father, I pray you'd use me and uh, let them not not hear me, but hear you through me. And God, just use these words, these, these few minutes that we have together. I pray that they'll receive something, that they'll receive what you, you gave to me and what you showed me in these, in these few minutes to come. In Jesus' name, amen. So, I want, to, I want to back up, so I'm just going to tell you kind of how I read the Bible, okay? And if it relates, great, but I think it will. If I read that right there and I'm in my quiet time, and I pray you have a quiet time. If you don't, come see me. We need to talk. These are days when you don't have an, you don't have an option not to have a quiet time with God. Uh, the, the, those days are over. Uh, well, like I said, the hour is late. Uh, it's not debatable. Uh, pastor would I agree with him a million percent all the prophecy has been fulfilled all the prophecy has been fulfilled Jesus compared it in Matthew to labor, uh, labor pains let me tell you in 67 the water broke 
Israel became a nation, the baby's coming. It's coming. When the water breaks, there ain't no going back and backing out of it. You guys know that. So we know the time is coming. So we need to be digging in right now because there's coming a time in this country very soon and they're doing it now where they're making the Bible more reader-friendly, okay? Where they kind of remove some words around and make it where it's just not so direct about this gender or that deal or, you know. So we've got to be careful. Knowledge is mentioned 15 times in three chapters in 2 Peter. If you were writing that letter to whoever it would be to, if you mention something 15 times in just three in just three pages, at 15 times, you better pay attention to that word. Knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. There's coming a time when you need to know this book. So we so if I'm reading this. And, and Gene, you'll appreciate it. You'll get a kick out of this. When I read that, my mind just blows right through them words. I do. And so I have to train myself to slow down. These words are precious words. They mean something. Every word in this book has meaning. And if we get too busy in our schedule and we're trying to get through this, we'll blow right through something. And I'm going to show you that. So back in, verse, in, in chapter 1, verse 1, who's he writing this to? He tells you right there, to those who through the righteousness of our, Lord, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. I've told you to underline that word precious. I'm going to tell you why. That word has a, has a meaning that you, if you don't know it, you'll read right across this. And you just say precious. It's costly. He's writing to those that have had a faith. They're believing in this Jesus that they've been preaching about in a country with a leader that wants to kill them unmercifully. This faith of theirs is costing them everything, but yet they're still, they still want it, and it's growing and spreading. These Christians are irritating this, this emperor. I mean, why don't they just be quiet? He's trying to snuff them out and keep them quiet. But if I'm, not, if I'm reading that, I'll blow right through that. So if, if you go back when you read it, and he says, to those who, brought, who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as costly as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of our Jesus our Lord. Grace and peace in abundance. How is this possible? How can you have grace and peace in the middle of that? Can you imagine? Let me ask you this. Do you have grace and peace now in the situation that we're in now? Do you? If you don't, how come? Because if where we're headed, and, and this, these are the conditions, guys, that, that Jesus left in. Do you understand that? He left in these conditions. And so we know our, it's not that bad here right now. I can tell you, how is it possible to have grace and peace in abundance? He tells you right there. And it's through the knowledge of God. Through the knowledge of God. How do you get, how do you get knowledge? And it keeps coming up, knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. You get it through reading this word every day. Getting it in your mind. Getting it in your soul. Memorizing scripture. When the enemy comes to attack, first thing you do is grab this book. I love this book. I love it. I try to read it every day. I got a set time that I get along with God every day, every morning. I'm in this word. You dads, some of you have kids that are still at home. Some of them are grown and gone like mine. Do they see your Bible out? Is there, are there signs that you're having that quiet time? Do they see that? That's important. It's very important. Uh, you're sitting. They're watching you. They're watching you. Um. Let's keep reading. Verse 3. His divine power. This, this gets good. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. What is a godly life? A, a godly life is true godliness. True, true godliness is a genuine reverence toward God that governs one's attitude toward every aspect of life. I'm going to read that again. True godliness is a genuine reverence toward God that governs 
everything. One's attitude toward every aspect of life. That's your family. That's your job. That's your recreational time. That's your golf time, your hunting time, boys. That's your fishing time. It governs every aspect of your life, your reverence towards God. It's there with you. It ain't something you pick up and, and pick up and, and leave when you go on vacation. You pick it up when you walk back in the door. It's something you take with you everywhere you go. When people see you, they know something different about you. What is it? You know. Let's keep reading. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him. There it is. Who called us by his own glory and goodness. Glory and goodness. Man, when I read that, Pastor, it jumped off at me. Glory and goodness. We read right by that. and we just If somebody were to ask you, what's the difference in glory and goodness? There's a big difference. Big difference. Glory... I tell you what, if you got your word of God, let's turn back to uh, turn back to Exodus 33. Great story, I love 33, Exodus 33, and we're going down to uh, verse 18. But I'm and I'm going to tell you what the difference is between glory and goodness. Okay, we're talking about God's glory and God's goodness. If somebody were to ask you, can you explain that? Could you do it? God's glory is a word that's used to express his excellence. There's not, a, there's not another word. There's no, there's no word in the dictionary, one word, that can really explain the excellence of God, his character, his, all of his traits, everything combined into one. Uh, his knowledge, his wisdom, his his omnipresence he, he, he's omnipotent he's everything that you ever could imagine you can't explain it if you could if I could explain it I wouldn't why would I want to serve why would I want to lay everything on the line for something that I could explain you can't explain it uh, you can go back and read Job 38 in your time I love Job 38 Job's been in some bad situation and his buddies have tried to tell him that he's done this and that and God finally has enough of it and in Job 38, he finally tells him, he said, okay, brace yourself like a man. I'm going to question you, and then you tell me, who laid the foundations of the earth? Were you there? Surely you can tell me. God's glory, we can't explain that, guys. It is unbelievable, okay? If you were to see his glory, as you're going to see in here, you, it would, you, wouldn't, you would die. His glory is that unbelievable. So glory... Is the, is the word that is used to express the excellence of God. It's everything. Goodness, in your Bible, and in, in a lot of, if you've got a, a King James or New King James, it says glory and virtue. Goodness and virtue. Okay? So what is, what is goodness and virtue? Goodness is, it's when God expresses his excellence in deeds. In other words, it's virtue in action his goodness is when he actually moves and shows you his glory so i want to read something to you because i've missed this forever and uh i seen something and i want you to see it we're all we've all heard this story and, and if you've been here very long you've heard it and pastor it's a uh, does an awesome job he preached this then Mo, uh, verse 18 right there says then moses Said, and you got to think about it before we get get reading this. Moses and God are having a little, they having a little talk. They'd been up on the mountain, and the Israelites had made a golden calf, and the Lord saw it, and He said, "Get out, go back, go back down to your people. He's fixing to destroy them." Moses comes down, straightens it out. They get rid of the calf. He goes back to the Lord, and the Lord said, "Listen, take take the Israelites and go." I'm going to send an angel with you, but I, I can't go with you. Because if I do, I'm going to destroy you. And Moses says, God, you know, you've always been with me. If you don't go with me, I don't want to leave. I don't want to leave without your presence. And so they begin to talk. And God relents and he says, I, I, my presence will go with you. And then Moses turns around in verse 18 and he says, 
Then Moses said, now show me your glory. Now Moses is asking for what? To see his glory. Okay? You can't see his glory. His glory is, I mean, everything's in that. Okay? So what does God say? And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy. There it is, virtue in action, goodness. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion, virtue in action, guys, on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there's a place near me where you may stand on the rock. Hmm. I had a guy that mentored me a lot growing up. Hmm. I was reading this. Sorry. Uh, he used to read this to me, and it really hit me. He's there. The Lord said, there's a rock near me where you may stand, <clears throat> and my glory, when my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand. There's the goodness. Do you see it? Virtue in action. His goodness. He's going to cover him with his hand. What did Moses ask for? He asked to see his glory. God said, you can't see my glory and live, but I'm going to show you my goodness. Okay? So he puts him in the cleft. He covers him with his hand. But watch what God does. Then I will remove, and, and I, will I will put you in the cleft of rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand, and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. I have missed that my whole life. God's glory and his goodness. He allowed Moses to ask to see his glory, and he got to see his glory, just a glimpse of the back. God allowed him to see it. But he, he covered him with his... He, he said, I'm going to allow my goodness to pass by you so that my glory doesn't kill you. Because no man can see my face. But I tell you what I'm going to do, Moses... As I pass by, I'm going to remove my hand and you can see my back. Glory and goodness. Let's keep reading. Through these, glory and goodness, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of the world. These are your tools right here, guys. How do we live a Christian life in these last days? They're tough. I, 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 trust me, I'm with you a million percent. How do we get through them? How do we get through them? By this. We're going to add to our faith. And I love the amplified version. I tried to download it. I couldn't get it downloaded. But we're going to add to our faith goodness. What is goodness? Virtue in action. Okay? We need to take on that same goodness. To our goodness, I, the Amplified says, exercising goodness, develop knowledge. What is knowledge? Our intelligence about God. How do we learn about God? If we come in here and the only message we get is the pastors on Sunday morning or Pastor Donna's on Wednesday night, we are, mal we are malnourished. This, this, it, it, I can't stress it to you enough. Uh, I don't know how many times I've been out to eat with couples and they say, well, don't it say in the word? I know it says in there. No, no, no. If you don't know, find out before you say it because it may not say what you think it says. Okay? Don't misquote the Bible. No, no. Dig in there and know what, exactly what it says and say it. So the Amplified Version says to, to exercise knowledge, intelligence, develop self-control. Boy, if ever a time we need to self-control, it's now. Exercising self-control, develop perseverance. Perseverance in this book means patience and endurance. Developing perseverance 
or exercising perseverance develop godliness. This kind of godliness is piety, which is the quality of being reverent. Godliness, we need to produce and exercise and develop brotherly love. That's the brotherly love that we see in here all the time. Um, that's a mutual warm-hearted affection between believers. Uh, from, from, from exercising that brotherly love, we need to develop Christian love. Now, what's the difference there? He mentioned love twice. There's a difference. There is a difference. The difference is Christian love is love that is outgoing with selfless attitude that leads one to sacrifice everything for the good of others. That's the ultimate love. To sacrifice everything for the good of others, not for yourself. It's a selfless love. And he goes on to tell us that if we possess these things, we will never, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. You will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's your tools. What's different about this book uh, than the first? Somewhere along the way, false teachers had begun to uh, come into the picture. And so P Peter feels, he feels the necessary to, um, to deal with it. And so he deals with it in the second chapter of this book. Um, the second chapter is about false teachers. Uh, there will be false teachers in the last days. We know that. Um, you, how, do you, how do you deal with false teachers? By having the knowledge of the Lord and knowing what the Word says. Don't let somebody teach you something that's not in this book. I mean, you're, hey, you ought to know what's in here. You've got no excuse. You know what they would give in China for just one page of this? Missionaries over there take Bibles and there's not enough, and they tear pages out. They just want one page. And we've got these sitting everywhere in our houses. And yet we'd rather pick our cell phone up and play some game that means nothing other than read this word. I can't stress it to you enough. You're either going to get it or you're not. If you get it, hold on, because God will rock your world. I'm just telling you. He did it me. He'll take you places you never dreamed of and show you things you've never, you never thought you'd ever see. I just promise you. But in the third chapter, and I'm getting close to closing, 810. How am I doing? We good? I hadn't said anything bad yet, have I? Made anybody mad? I love, I love uh, ch uh, chapter 2, verse 19. He's talking about these people who are... Who are uh, He's talking about false teachers. And he's talking about people who have actually been saved before, but they've, they've, they've walked away from it. And uh, he says, They promise freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity. And then the last part of that, For people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. Man. That's it right there. That's, that's, that's it in a nutshell. People are masters to whatever, they are slaves to whatever has mastered them. My goodness. What has you mastered? What, 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 is, what, has, what are you a slave to? Is it that phone? Is it pornography? Is it a drug? Is it an addiction? Whatever it is, you're a slave to it. It's because it's got you mastered. It's time to break it. Break it. He winds up the last part of it, talking about the day of the Lord, to remind them, that no matter how bad it is, he is coming. He is coming back. There's going to be scoffers in the last day. They said, forever they said he's coming. Where's he at? He's coming, guys. And I'm telling you, day, the, day's a, the day's one closer than it was yesterday. But today, the, the reason, and, and I always wondered why, because he sees everything. We see little glimpses on the news of this and that, and it's bad. But God sees it all. And I often wonder what in the world, it, you know, how it could be that God up there can see all the, the abuse, the children, the, the abortions, the, 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 all the bad. How long will he wait? Why is he waiting? Because he's long-suffering. Hell must be really, really bad for him to allow all this to happen and continue to happen. And, and for him not to come back. I, I personally believe, like Pastor said, I believe, he's, I believe Jesus is ready. 
I believe God's got his hand up saying not yet I really do but you got to understand that he tells us right here for one day to God is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like one day we don't understand that his time is not on our time schedule but I'm telling you it's close I, I firmly believe it's close and you got to ask yourself are you ready are you ready